Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, to Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum. Just delighted to have you guys uh, with us today. We have a great presentation in line, so just uh, very excited uh, to be with you and uh, to have uh, this uh, dialogue today. Um, in just a second, we're going to open up in a word of prayer. Um, but first, just want to encourage you, as I always do, uh, to uh, refer to your chat box uh, to the right of your screen. And please, if you would, type in your name and your location. Just love to know who's uh, joining us today as uh, we engage in this conversation. And um, with that, we're going to get started uh, with a word of prayer. So bow your heads, if you would. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum. Thank you, Lord. Uh, for our organization uh, that utilizes medicine for the sake of the gospel. And Lord, I just thank you for uh, Dr. Fielder, um, who comes today uh, from African Mission Healthcare today, uh, who is a partner in the work uh, for the sake of the gospel. And I just pray that you would bless him uh, and uh, just uh, honor his words uh, as he uh, shares with us. And uh, just thank you for his time. In Christ's name, we do pray. Amen. All right, well, uh, again, today, delighted to have Dr. John Fielder. He's coming uh, live to us today from Kajabi, Kenya. Uh, just uh, excited for him uh, to give this presentation, Clinical Manifestations and Diagnosis of HIV, uh, HIV-Associated Tuberculosis. Uh, a little bit about John. Uh, uh, Dr. Fielder uh, received his uh, Doctor of Medicine from Baylor College uh, of Medicine in 1999. Uh, graduating AOA, um, and uh, then completed his uh, internal medicine residency at uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital, and he received a very prestigious award, Most Oslarian, the highest award given to a, a Hopkins intern. So uh, John uh, is uh, very gifted in internal medicine. From there, uh, Dr. Fielder moved uh, to Kenya, and uh, he served uh, at one of our partner hospitals, Kajabi Hospital, and uh, his uh, focus uh, was uh, providing um, health care uh, for patients infected with uh, HIV and um, training up uh, Kenyan uh, health care providers. Uh, so he's really just led the charge in doing uh, tremendous work uh, with uh, regard to HIV and, um, and training up uh, fellow colleagues uh, in um, uh, developing world uh, countries like um, Kenya. John also served in Malawi in uh, Southern Africa and worked with Partners in Hope Medical Center, a clinic also focused on the care of, uh, of patients infected with HIV. And it was there while he was serving in Malawi in 2010 that he and his college roommate, uh, Mark Gearson, who's a businessman and philanthropist, developed African Mission Healthcare. And if you're not familiar with this organization, I highly encourage you. They're very like-minded with Samaritan's Purse. We work collaboratively on a lot of projects together. So excited to be working uh, with AMH and Dr. Fielder. So um, AMH is a nonprofit organization with a mission to strengthen mission hospitals to aid those in greatest needs. In uh, 2014, uh, Dr. Fielder uh, and his family returned to Kenya um, so that, uh, that John could uh, lead the uh, growing efforts of AMH. Uh, and he serves as the uh, chief executive uh, for this organization. He's also a consultant physician at Mayoa Methodist uh, Hospital in Kenya, and he serves uh, as an adjunct assistant professor of medicine with the University of Texas Medical Branch. So I know Dr. Field is a very busy man, so we're just honored to have him uh, with us today. Again, he continues to live with his family at Rift Valley Academy in Kajabi, Kenya. And uh, John, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you to present clinical manifestations and diagnosis of HIV-associated tuberculosis. Thank you very much, Lance. It's uh, great to be with everyone here today. Uh, I was sharing with Lance uh, before we got on that uh, I got my start with World Medical Mission and SP uh, way back in 2002 uh, before moving on to join some uh, longer-term uh, missions in, in Kenya and Malawi. So it's uh, always great to, uh, to, to work with, with SP and uh, see uh, the great uh, things they're doing all over the world. Um, today, I'd like to uh, share with you about uh, HIV-associated TB and particularly uh, how we diagnose and manage it in uh, resource-limited settings, which is going to be uh, somewhat different than than in a more resource-rich setting. Next slide, please. Uh, so here is uh, uh, here are our objectives. Uh, we're not going to go over uh, 
uh, detailed treatment regimens. That's uh, beyond the, the scope of the talk today. Uh, I do want to talk about the limited TB diagnostics we have in, in our setting here in, in Africa. Uh, but um, often we have to make an empiric diagnosis of tuberculosis because of limited uh, diagnostics. Next slide, please. Um, I want to uh, emphasize that there is a difference between how we would approach these problems here and uh, in the settings that many of you are in, in Europe or, or the US. There are a lot of drug interactions with uh, TB medicines and also with antiretroviral therapy. So I always encourage people to, to look those up anytime they add a new medicine. Next slide, please. So something about the epidemiology. TB is the leading uh, infectious disease killer worldwide. Um, not everyone realizes that. Uh, it's also the leading killer of people with HIV, um, accounting for about a quarter of all deaths of people with HIV worldwide. So that's a tragedy. It's also an opportunity because TB is a, is a treatable illness. So if we can diagnose and treat it earlier, then we can really prevent a lot of those deaths. Next slide, please. Um, you, you see there on the upper right of this infographic that 7 million were detected and notified, but 3 million people with TB were undiagnosed. So that adds up to a total of, of 10 million, but only 70% of those were actually detected and meaning they, they were diagnosed and enrolled in a national uh, TB treatment program. Uh, the, the, the situation in Kenya is uh, actually quite a bit worse than that. Uh, based on a study that was done by the Kenya Medical Research Institute that was very well done across the country. And they found that the detection rate was probably about 40%. So uh, there was probably about 60% of the people with TB who, who were missed and, and not diagnosed and not in care. And of course, continuing uh, to spread to other people. I think that uh, across Africa, uh, that's, uh, that, that finding is gonna be pretty consistent. Next slide, please. So the TB HIV epidemic is uh, really a perfect storm of, of, of two coincident epidemics. And this infographic shows where those things uh, overlap. So in a lot of East and Southern Africa, you see that uh, there's a, uh, a contemporaneous TB epidemic along with HIV. And of course that makes uh, a, a lot of biological sense that uh, you have a lot of people with suppressed immune systems who are, are at risk both for uh, contracting TB and rapidly progressing to active TB disease, as well as reactivating latent TB disease. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows the, the incident rates of, of tuberculosis, and you can see that we have a lot darker colors there in uh, Southern Africa. Uh, the rate for Kenya, uh, there in East Africa, it's shaded as between 200 and 299 per 100,000. But as I mentioned uh, uh, in the earlier slide, that number is actually 558 per 100,000. So two and a half times the rate that the WHO has, has published um, based upon that really good study done by the Kenya Medical Research Institute. Um, also, that, even that estimate is uh, 558 per 100,000 is probably an, uh, an underestimate because that only looked at pulmonary tuberculosis. It didn't look at extra pulmonary tuberculosis like the lymph nodes and uh, TB meningitis, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, just to give context, uh, I think the, you can see there in North America, the United States, I think it's probably about three per 100,000. We're at the lowest rate of tuberculosis uh, ever in our history. Next slide, please. So what you probably remember from your medical education was uh, the classic upper lobe cavitary disease of, of HIV negative tuberculosis or sometimes occurs with uh, HIV and, and, and HIV infected patients who still have a strong immune system. So the immunology here is that uh, the body localizes the TB and usually prevents it from spreading uh, outside of the lung. And the TB has a preference for the highly oxygenated areas of the upper lobes. Uh, 
And so this is a classic x-ray there you see in the right upper lobe, uh, a very large cavity. Uh, th these cases can be very destructive. You see on this x-ray that the trachea is deviated to the right. And uh, these kinds of cases are usually the ones that are gonna be AFB sputum smear positive. As we'll talk about in a little bit, that's one of the real challenges with diagnosing HIV, uh, tuberculosis and HIV infected individuals is that the sputum smears are not as helpful. Next slide, please. So before the advent of the HIV epidemic, most tuberculosis was confined to the lung. Uh, that's about 85% of the cases. Now in the era of HIV, uh, most cases are actually outside the lung, meaning either they are extrapulmonary alone in their manifestations or they're pulmonary and extrapulmonary. And, and this again reflects the, the biology and immunology of, of a suppressed immune system allowing TB to uh, escape the confines of the lung, spread around uh, usually through the blood and, and land somewhere else. Um, and it can land anywhere, the liver, the spleen, the gut, the brain, the lymph nodes. Um, we'll go over some of those examples. Uh, there was a study from, from South Africa that uh, did autopsies on people who died of suspected TB. And uh, I believe either all of them or almost all of them at autopsy had TB outside of the lung. So I usually tell people to think about uh, HIV associated TB here in Africa as a multi-system disease, almost like lupus. Uh, that it, it's uncommon that the TB would just be com confined to the lung. And uh, although that, can be devastating for the patient. It's also something that we can use diagnostically, clinically. Uh, if, for example, uh, a patient is uh, uh, coughing, has a, has a chronic cough, uh, but has a negative sputum smear, but then also has signs of uh, TB meningitis, or maybe has a lymph node that you can perform a fine needle aspiration, then we can use those other signs and symptoms of TB to, to help us diagnose uh, smear negative tuberculosis. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these studies are a little bit older, and I did uh, go to the literature to try to see if, if there's been updated data. And, and really, this is the most recent that we have, you know, close to 20 years old. But uh, they, they, these two studies in Southern Africa found that uh, TB was the most common cause of chronic cough in, in Africa. So people with cough uh, greater than three weeks, uh, these were about half of the cases. Uh, usually patients in the outpatient setting get multiple courses of antibiotics and they're not responding. Um, uh, they may or may not have a sputum smear or what's called a gene expert, which we'll talk about later uh, performed. But if they're missed in that setting and just continue to get repeated courses of antibiotics, uh, then really what happens is, is a case that um, is at MOA Hospital right now. Uh, in this case, it's an HIV negative 18 year old who has very, very destructive tuberculosis that, that clearly has been going on for six months or more um, and, and will probably either um, leave him disabled or, or, or possibly kill him. So unfortunately, um, a lot of these cases are missed in the outpatient setting. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what does the x-ray look like? Uh, I mentioned in HIV negative tuberculosis that you have classic destructive upper lobe cavities. Um, you can also have uh, uh, classic miliary tuberculosis, miliary named after the millet seeds, uh, the, the appearance of millet seeds studying various organs in the body. And we'll take a look at, at such an example or pleural tuberculosis with uh, a pleural effusion. But in HIV associated tuberculosis, it can be sort of anything. It can look like an acute pneumonia. Uh, it can look like pneumocystis pneumonia, PJP pneumonia. We'll look at an example of that. You can just have lymphadenopathy in, in the chest without any signs of um, a parenchymal disease. Uh, and then in, in 20, 25% of the cases, you can actually have a normal chest X-ray in a patient with um, culture positive tuberculosis, which of course makes the diagnosis that much more difficult. Next slide, please. So here's another example of uh, HIV negative uh, cavitary classic tuberculosis with bilateral upper lobe lung disease and uh, cavities uh, 
you would really expect this patient to be sputum smear positive. Um, he came in and, and was already diagnosed before uh, our team met him. And he had been put on TB treatment uh, after four months of cough and showed up with this x-ray. And about two weeks later, he was admitted with, with seizures. And, and so we actually switched his registration from pulmonary tuberculosis. The registration is how you register them with a the national TB program from pulmonary tuberculosis to uh, TB of the brain. And you might say, well, how did you diagnose that? And, and really it was based on this x-ray, his history of already being on TB treatment and his central nervous system findings. Because although we can do uh, a lumbar puncture in our setting, there's really nothing in the lumbar puncture that can quote unquote rule in or rule out TB meningitis. And I, I, I really uh, recommend to people not to use the terminology, which if you work in an, in an African mission hospital, you'll hear it used sometimes, rule out uh, TB. Um, I, I, I really uh, discourage that uh, terminology because the tests we have just aren't good enough. And we'll go over that, um, those tests in a little bit. Uh, so next slide, please. This is uh, classic miliary tuberculosis, all those um, uh, uh, dotted seed, that uh, dotted seed-like appearance. This is really a manifestation of extrapulmonary tuberculosis. Uh, you can uh, be assured that the TB is in the blood in this case. And if you were able to look with an ultrasound at the liver, at the spleen, you're gonna be, see the same kind of studying um, in those places. So sometimes these patients come in and they're quite sick because it's also seeded the brain. Next slide, please. This is uh, an x-ray except for the cavity in the left upper lobe. Uh, if you just looked at the sort of bat wing uh, ground glass appearance um, that's greater on the right than the left, you might say that looks a lot like pneumocystis pneumonia. And that's one of the major challenges we have in differential diagnosis is that a patient comes in, they, they might uh, be hypoxemic, um, sick for a few weeks, and, and they have an x-ray maybe it doesn't show a cavity like this one, and you look at it and you say, well, that could be PJP, pneumocystis, or it could be TB. And, and again, because our tests are not great, if you, if you don't get a positive sputum smear or a positive gene expert, you're kind of left um, make, making an empirical diagnosis. So sometimes we might treat someone like that with uh, uh, PJP therapy and see how they respond. Um, if they're really sick, sometimes we have to treat them for both uh, because we can't delay the treatment. In this particular case, the cavity really tips you off that this is going to be tuberculosis because uh, PJP pneumocystis does not cavitate. Next slide, please. This is an example of intrathoracic lymphadenopathy, and this is a difference between HIV-associated and, and HIV-negative tuberculosis. And, and people without HIV, they don't get as much intrathoracic lymphadenopathy. But in, in this particular case on, uh, on the uh, x-ray on your left, there's fullness in the hilar space and in, in the AP window. And that's, um, uh, that's a lymph node uh, secondary to TB. And we know that this was a case of TB because uh, the patient was actually sputum smear positive. There's also a little bit of a hazy kind of ground glass infiltrate there in the left mid lung zone. And you can see in the normal x-ray on the right side that the AP window has that normal curved appearance and is not full with a lymph node. This patient was interesting. She had uh, started uh, antiretroviral therapy for the first time five days before this x-ray was taken and had come in with a headache and the, the Kenyan clinical officer um, quite astutely thought she might have um, cryptococcal meningitis and in fact her cryptococcal antigen test was positive but she continued to be febrile and sick and then this we saw this x-ray and, and, and her sputum smear was also positive so she had both cryptococcal meningitis and uh, at least pulmonary tuberculosis, if not um, extrapulmonary tuberculosis. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, three really uh, key take-home messages. Most cases of HIV-related TB are extrapulmonary. That study by Wong and PLOS1 is the one that I was mentioning from South Africa in which they found at autopsy that uh, all these cases were extrapulmonary. Um, or by that, we mean they either had uh, pulmonary TB and extrapulmonary TB or uh, extrapulmonary TB um, clinical manifestations of 
Uh, most pulmonary uh, HIV associated uh, TB cases are AFB and smear negative. Now, again, we'll talk about the gene expert in a little bit. Um, the gene expert is more widespread uh, in its availability now, uh, but, but it, depending on where you work, um, uh, many mission hospitals still rely on, on the AFB smear. And as I mentioned at the outset, TB is the leading killer of HIV positive patients worldwide. Next slide, please. So it can come in, in many different forms. Uh, uh, years ago, when I worked at Kijabi, there, we had a Brazilian pathologist and she said uh, you know, that she'd worked for a number of years in Brazil and thought she'd seen TB everywhere. But when she, when she came here, she saw it in the esophagus, she saw it in the elbow. So basically it can be anywhere. Uh, the most common place outside the lung is the lymph node. And again, you can use that diagnostically uh, because maybe they have the characteristic findings of TB lymphadenitis, or maybe you can uh, put a, a needle in and do a fine needle aspirate, and that can actually be put in the gene expert machine as well. Uh, pleural TB is, is common, uh, and, and we'll uh, see an example of that. Uh, Dr. Rick Sacra, who uh, works at ELWA Hospital in Liberia, uh, which is a partner hospital also of SP and our own organization, he wrote me about a case uh, earlier this week of a, of a patient with pericardial TB that he had to, to do a pericardiosynthesis on. So these are things that we see quite commonly. Next slide, please. This patient came in uh, to our clinic in Malawi. Uh, she was a new patient in our HIV clinic and she had uh, these uh, ulcerations in, in her axilla basically uh, lymph nodes that had uh, ulcerated through the skin. And, and what we did was just take a, a slide and press it to that exudate. And in the lab, it was AFB uh, smear positive. And then she had hypotension and the x-ray and the ultrasound were consistent with pericardial effusion. So uh, the presumptive diagnosis there was also uh, pericardial TB. And we did not do a pericardiosynthesis, but we had to admit her and put her on dopamine and give her fluids overnight and, and she recovered and, and did well. Next slide, please. Here's pleural tuberculosis, which is uh, technically a form of extrapulmonary tuberculosis. Uh, there's a, a good uh, a clinical rule of thumb that about 90% of HIV related pleural effusions in Africa are TB. So the WHO guidelines for, for TB diagnosis in HIV infected patients is that if you see pleural TB, you, you can just, if you see a pleural effusion, you can just treat for TB. Usually what we'll do is, is do a small thoracentesis. I like to just do a thoracentesis and look at the fluid. If it's pure pus, then you know, you're worried that that's a bacterial empyema and they're gonna need a chest tube or a surgeon. If it's blood, then you do worry, it, could it possibly be malignancy? The chief one that we worry about in the plural space is Kaposi sarcoma in HIV infected patients. Uh, but if it's the usual kind of clear straw color, maybe a little bit turbid, that's very consistent with TB. And it's usually AFB negative. I, I really don't even send it to the lab looking for AFB. Um, so again, the WHO says that empirical treatment is necessary. Usually we try to at least uh, take a look at the fluid. Most of these patients, do not need a chest tube. Um, some come in in extremis and they have complete white out of the lung and, and you may need to put a chest tube. Some just to make them feel better faster, you can do a high volume thoracentesis. So usually what we'll do then is, is use a, if we have a 16 gauge, sometimes an 18 gauge cannula, we'll insert it and then hook it up to a, to a Foley catheter and bag and just let it drain. Uh, in the past, people used to give steroids uh, for uh, pleural TB in HIV infected patients. We don't do that anymore because it did not lead to improved outcomes, but it did lead to a higher risk of developing Kaposi sarcoma later. The steroids activate uh, human herpes virus 8, which is the agent of uh, Kaposi sarcoma. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a case of pericardial TB and, you know, uh, similar to pleural effusion, about 90% of these in Africa are are tuberculosis. So you don't have to do a pericardiosynthesis for diagnosis. Sometimes a patient is in tamponade and is going to need a pericardiosynthesis to um, get them out of shock. In this case, you're helped again by the fact that there are cavitary lesions in the right upper lung field. And again, the, the World Health Organization says 
and, and it says this about most forms of extrapulmonary TB, that empirical treatment is perfectly acceptable. And just like with portal effusions, we don't use steroids routinely any longer in these patients for the same reasons. In, in a trial that came out several years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, there was not any improvement in outcome, but there was an increased risk down the line of Kaposi's sarcoma. I've had a couple of cases uh, where uh, patients have had persistent pericardial effusions, particularly following the initiation of antiretroviral therapy. That's something called IRIS or the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. When a patient with a very low CD4 count starts powerful uh, combination antiretroviral therapy, uh, what tends to happen very quickly is that uh, the immune system uh, improves and, and the newly emboldened and empowered immune system starts attacking all the antigen that's around. And that's what happened in the earlier case I said of the woman who had both cryptococcal meningitis and pulmonary TB. She also had immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. So I have found in a few cases of uh, persistent uh, pericardial effusions that sometimes go out for four months um, following starting antiretroviral therapy that uh, I do, I've had to add steroids. Um, uh, th this is, I'll, I'll note, if you uh, go to the uh, SP website and, and download my, my book from uh, 10 years ago, most of the data there is, uh, and, and most of the recommendations are still very relevant, uh, but this is one exception. Uh, since, since the book was written, we know that we don't give steroids routinely for pericardial TB anymore. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, POTS disease uh, sticking out through the back of this man's shirt. This is called a gibbous deformity. He's actually a community health worker at a clinic in South Sudan called Sudan Medical Relief. He uh, suffered from POTS disease and was left with this angulated deformity of his spine. He, he actually runs a, uh, a stall uh, as his business in the local market, but the way this clinic works is that every morning patients come to pick up their medicines under directly observed therapy and he volunteers his time to go and help other people suffering from TB. Uh, this is usually again a, a clinical diagnosis based upon the physical exam and the x-ray. Uh, I've, I've just uh, diagnosed this several times by lifting the shirt <laughs> when, when the patient clearly hadn't had their shirt lifted for several months uh, prior to presentation. Uh, to see the, the classic angulated gibbous deformity in the back. Next slide, please. Mycobacteremia is a, another one of the real diagnostic challenges that we have. That uh, means uh, TB in the blood. Uh, I did update the data in this slide and it's still uh, pretty consistent uh, up until this time that anywhere from one of 10 to one of four patients with advanced AIDS who comes into the hospital has mycobacteremia. So, you know, if you see very advanced patients with HIV, which we don't see as much as we used to because of the widespread availability of antiretroviral therapy, but still sometimes either, you know, patients have uh, a delayed entering care or maybe they failed their first line antiretroviral therapy, then they come into the hospital quite wasted. So you have to think about TB in the blood, even if you don't find it anywhere else. You might have a normal x-ray, you may not find lymph nodes, uh, so you have to think that maybe these patients have TB in the blood. Um, there's no easy way to diagnose. We will talk about a, a one possible way in a resource limited setting in a few slides. It, it sometimes looks a little bit like typhoid, but often lasts longer, you know, uh, uh, several more weeks than typhoid and patients are very wasted. Next slide, please. Uh, I've, I usually say that this particular study uh, has had the most impact on my clinical practice in Africa. Uh, it was a very well done study. It's, it's 15 or so years old now, maybe even older, but they looked at a group of patients, medical inpatients, who showed up at Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital in Blantyre, Malawi with a hemoglobin less than seven grams per deciliter, so as defined as severe anemia. And then it divided them into two groups. It said if they're HIV positive or H HIV negative. Among the HIV negative, the leading cause there was hookworm. But in the HIV positive, they did extensive workups, cultures, um, even bone marrow biopsies and cultures. And they found that it, I believe it was 44% of them had disseminated tuberculosis. Another quarter had bacteremia, often a type of uh, salmonella called non-typhi salmonella. 10% uh, had, had malaria. 
most of them don't have vitamin or iron deficiency uh, as the driving force for, for their severe anemia. So that's a mistake uh, that people have made in the past is just to think that patients need vitamins when actually it's infections that are driving this severe anemia. Next slide. Uh, TB meningitis, another difficult uh, diagnosis to make. Uh, epidemiologically, it's the second most common form of meningitis in the HIV infected population in Africa. Cryptococcus is the most common, and at least fortunately with, with Cryptococcus, we do have a good test. So most mission hospitals are going to have the cryptococcal antigen, which can either be done on a cerebral spinal fluid or can be done on serum. And it's a good test uh, either way. Uh, so sometimes we'll have someone come in, maybe they've been sick with a central nervous system syndrome for several weeks, uh, their CD4 is low, uh, and the first thing we think of is cryptococcus. If that's negative, the next thing we think of is, is TB. Next slide, please. TB meningitis can take several forms. It can be in the base of the brain, uh, and it can be a mass of TB, uh, like toxoplasmosis, that's a mistake that people make who maybe practiced uh, HIV medicine in the United States or in the West where toxoplasmosis is more common. Uh, they'll assume that a patient maybe has a CT scan that shows a, a ring enhancing mass and they'll think it's toxoplasmosis. But in most of Africa, in most of East and Southern Africa, toxo is, is quite uncommon. It's a little bit more common in West Africa. And TB can actually cause a stroke syndrome from a vasculitis, sometimes without any of the other forms that you see there. Patients can just present with a stroke. So, you know, ideally it would be great if we could detect it either through culture or nucleic acid. Uh, there, again, I'll, I'll talk about this when we get to the gene expert slide, uh, but the gene expert um, test kits we have now are not particularly good at detecting TB in the CSF. A lumbar puncture, yes, you could have high lymphocytes, you could have high protein, but it, it's, it's not determinative one way or the other. So again, the WHO says a clinical diagnosis is acceptable, and sometimes there's evidence of TB elsewhere in the body. I, I often uh, uh, use here an example of a case that I saw many years ago at Kijabi. Uh, a young man in our HIV clinic he was newly diagnosed. He came in very sick. He was coughing. He had sputum smear positive tuberculosis. And uh, at that time, no patient left the clinic without meeting with a medication counselor to make sure that they understood the medicine. So he wasn't on the HIV medicines yet, but he was going out on TB medicines. It was late in the day. The nurse came to me and said, there's no counselor. I said, no, I'll talk to him. So my Swahili's not that good. Uh, I'm trying to talk to him and he just doesn't understand anything, which, uh, you know, I went to get somebody who spoke the local language of Kikuyu. Again, he didn't understand anything. And it was just clear that he wasn't hearing well and he wasn't thinking well. And so it was really clear that he just didn't have pulmonary TB. He had CNS tuberculosis as well. So we switched his registration uh, in the national program to, to TB meningitis treatment because the treatment is different. Next to slide, please. Uh, just uh, a couple of words about pediatric TB, a million uh, global infections. Uh, like people with HIV, uh, kids have weak immune systems. So they tend not to cavitate uh, and they tend to disseminate. So you get a lot of uh, spinal TB and you get a lot of TB meningitis. Uh, uh, BCG vaccination does help to, to mitigate that problem, but its impact on pulmonary tuberculosis probably wanes as people get older. Next slide, please. The WHO has uh, put out what they call the danger signs for TB. Now you can see here that these are just the set of vital signs and, and a general uh, glance at the patient's functional status. Uh, so this could be anything, right? I mean, this could be acute malaria. There's so many things that this could be, but what they're trying to do is get people to think about TB because it's been missed so often as, as we talked about in um, in the studies and the, and the gap in the notification rate. So the WHO says suspect disseminated TB in all people living with HIV who experience rapid or marked weight loss, fever, or night sweats. So in Malawi, we had a, a community education and follow-up program. We had community health workers who went out and followed up patients. So our community health workers knew. I mean, if they came back and said, you know, I saw Mary, she started antiretroviral therapy two weeks ago, and she's already lost 10% of her body weight. And I'd say, well, what do you think's going on? They'd say, I think she has TB. 
uh, and usually that was right. Uh, and then it says uh, the WHO also recommends that uh, whenever people uh, strongly suspect TB, even if they don't have a great uh, uh, microbiological uh, confirmation, that they should go ahead and initiate empirical treatment for uh, disseminated TB. Next slide, please. Uh, generally, what ends up happening when a patient comes in who's, who's quite ill is that they get uh, a trial of antibiotics. Usually that's ceftriaxone in many mission hospitals these days. And then it depends on what other diagnostic modalities might be there. Um, chest x-ray if you have it, either a sputum for AFB or a gene expert if you have it. I'll talk about the urine lamb test in a little bit. And then you see, do they improve? Either do you find evidence of TB? Maybe you saw a uh, miliary finding or a pleural effusion on the x-ray, or maybe the gene expert turns positive uh, after it's done on day two or day three, um, or maybe all those tests are negative. And after three or four days, the patient doesn't improve on broad spectrum antibiotics. It's now time to treat that patient for tuberculosis. Next slide, please. So, you know, we have several modalities, biopsies uncommonly uh, available where I work. If you talk to a patient about a biopsy, if they don't have uh, insurance, uh, it just doesn't, it doesn't get done. And then of course, you've got to um, send it all the way to Nairobi and wait for the result. I mean, the patients are in the hospital because they're sick. So if you wait that long, there's a serious risk of that patient deteriorating. Culture, likewise, is even less available to, to our patients in most settings. Um, sputum AFB smear is great, but as I mentioned before, it has poor sensitivity. Um, the gene expert has been a, a step forward. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at what the machine looks like, uh, but that is a direct detection of uh, TB DNA uh, through PCR testing. And then there's a test for a surface glycoprotein called LAM. Uh, that gets shed in the urine in patients with advanced AIDS. And you can do a quick test on a card uh, that only takes 30 minutes. Uh, it's great if it's positive, but if it's negative, it doesn't help you that much. Next slide, please. So this was the first uh, gene expert machine in Malawi at our clinic at Partners in Hope. And it, as I mentioned, it was, it was a nice step forward because it's more sensitive than the AFB sputum smear. It can also take some extra pulmonary samples, particularly FMAs of a, of a lymph node. It really functions like a, a, a Hewlett Packard uh, printer cartridge. That's what it looks like. And you just take the sample, you digest it in their proprietary reagent, and then you stick it in the machine. And three hours later, it, it gives you a yes or no. And it also tells you if uh, resistance to rifampicin is present or not. Uh, which is very good for monitoring the possible spread of drug-resistant tuberculosis. So the sensitivity is probably, any, it depends on what studies you look at, but you could easily be talking anywhere from uh, two to seven times as sensitive as, as AFB sputum smears. And there's a new cartridge that's uh, been developed, and I, I don't know why it hasn't been rolled out yet, but it's even more sensitive and it's better for uh, samples from the, uh, the central nervous system. Next slide, please. So what do we do? As I mentioned, we try to do a chest X-ray. We have strong clinical suspicion. Take a good history. Patients will often tell you, well, I was just coughing from last week. But if you really push them and say, okay, okay, so you're telling me you weren't coughing two weeks ago. Oh, no, no, I was coughing, just not as bad. What about a month ago? Well, I was coughing, just not as bad. So now you've changed what might just be either bacterial pneumonia or possibly pneumocystis, and, and you're thinking now about uh, tuberculosis. And then again, uh, what I call hooks, looking for TB elsewhere in the body, you know, a pleural effusion, the lymph nodes, the severe anemia, um, signs of CNS TB, uh, you know, looking for those um, uh, signs of TB outside the chest that could help you make a, a diagnosis of TB inside the chest. Next slide, please. So it, I, I put this slide here because uh, sometimes patients or are, are, uh, clinicians are quite reluctant to, to start TB treatment, which is understandable because it does have side effects and it, it is a six month uh, treatment course. But the WHO's uh, definition of, of TB is actually a decision to treat with a full course of TB therapy. So that seems a little bit circular, right? It, it, but it puts the, 
the, the responsibility in the hands of the clinician to go ahead and make a decision to treat uh, for a full course of uh, TB treatment, then suddenly that is a TB case. And, and to, to give you a sense that that's not um, unreal, unreasonable at all, if you look at the literature of uh, TB trials, a lot of uh, TB trials and TB research def define either definite TB, that is you find it microbiologically, or probable TB. Somebody went on TB treatment and they responded. So really the onus is on the clinician to pull that trigger. Next slide, please. Uh, you, you know, I, I, it, there's always that risk that you could overdiagnose. Uh, so I usually put it this way, you know, we can do what we're doing now, which is underdiagnose, where we're uh, diagnosing less than half of the cases in many African countries that we know are, are there. We can be perfect, but nobody's perfect, or we can overtreat a little. And, and I think if we're going to save more lives, we're, we're going to have to be more aggressive in, in treating TB. So, you know, if you see these, these combinations, we know, for example, that chronic cough is the number one cause, TB is the number one cause of chronic cough in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's also the number one cause of lymphadenopathy. Uh, same thing, number one cause of severe anemia. Um, it can cause hearing loss. So if you have someone who's got chronic cough, TB is very high on the, on the list, and then they have hearing loss, you ought to think if they disseminated TB to the base of the brain. And, and, and et cetera. You, you can do all kinds of different combinations. Next slide, please. So uh, I'll give this example uh, par partly to talk about the urine lamb, but that's not available in a lot of places, not because it's expensive or technically complicated. I think there just hasn't been a push to get it out there. We had it in Malawi, it was extremely useful, but we had a very high volume clinic. And, and the way that the test is sold, a lot of clinics uh, couldn't use all the tests in the pack. So this was uh, a patient who, who came in having just started antiretroviral therapy five days prior. He looked great. I mean, really um, did, did not look sick at all. His CD4 count was on the low side at 100 cells and he didn't have any headache. Um, and, 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 he did complain a profound hearing loss and had a minor uh, temperature of 38 degrees. So I was worried about three things. One was cryptococcal meningitis, two was syphilis of the brain, and three was TB meningitis. So his serum uh, VDRL was negative, not a great test, but uh, it's something. His uh, serum cryptococcal antigen was negative and uh, his urine lamb, this surface glycoprotein was positive. So we put him on TB meningitis uh, therapy and steroids, uh, which we often use in, in central nervous system tuberculosis, and he did great. He did really well. His hearing came back. Um, seems like I've got a few minutes left. Okay, uh, next slide, please. If we wait to treat, uh, then the, the outcomes are definitely worse. Um, even a short delay uh, of a day or two can, can often lead to significant deterioration. Even though the patient has been sick often for months before they come to you, mission hospitals tend to be referral hospitals. They, we tend to see the sickest patients who kind of fallen through the cracks. And by the time they come to us, uh, I have a saying that eventually all, all chronic diseases ignored long enough become acute. And sadly, that's what we often see with TB, particularly with TB meningitis. And just remember that this is responsible worldwide for one out of every four deaths of people with HIV, the number is even higher in Africa. So we need to be more aggressive. Next slide, please. I mentioned immune reconstitution and inflammatory syndrome before. I like, uh, as a doctor who worked in Western Kenya for many years, he calls it the awakening syndrome. Think of the body as waking up from, from its immunological slumber as it goes on antiretroviral therapy. And as that immune system uh, becomes a lot stronger, it attacks whether it's cryptococcal meningitis, Kaposi's sarcoma, or TB. Uh, so uh, this is often uh, a case where there was TB there that was not recognized when the patient started antiretroviral therapy. And then the symptoms of that were uh, and signs were elicited by the now strong immune system. So we call that unmasking iris. So sometimes that's the way we diagnose TB is through unmasking iris. Next slide, please. 
Uh, the treatment regimens, again, I'm not going to go into these in detail, but they are standardized and they're weight-based. There's a weight band, and generally patients are going to get two months of rifampicin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol, and four months, followed, followed by four months of rifampicin and isoniazid. TBM uh, depends on the country. Kenya uh, does a total of a year treatment, uh, so it extends the RH component. Um, and if you go through a second episode, there's, there's a retreatment regimen. If the gene expert shows there's multidrug resistant TB, then you have to refer to the national program. Again, lots of drug interactions um, between uh, rifampicin and drugs like antiretroviral therapy. Uh, often we have to change the, the medicines or increase the dose. Uh, warfarin is another one. Uh, I, the list could go on and on, anti-seizure medicines. Next slide, please. So I think that uh, brings me to the end of my time and I'll pass it back to Lance. All right, well, John, thank you so much. Uh, that was a, a, a great um, and easy to follow presentation. Um, I know we already have a number of uh, questions. I have a couple myself, but uh, we'll start off. Uh, Dr. Sawyer has several. Um, initial, <laughs> his initial question, <laughs> his initial question, are grants available um, for, um, for acquisition of gene expert and does the manufacturer offer a uh, reduced prices for gene expert for hospitals in limited resource settings? Uh, so those are generally rolled out through the national TB programs now. Um, for example, Kijabi has one, but Maua doesn't. Um, we bought that one in Malawi privately. Generally, they, they you know, government hospitals tend to be, the, the, tend, tend to get them first. Uh, but th these are all through the national program now. And then the cartridge cost, the, the Gates Foundation helped to underwrite the cost of developing this test. The Gene Expert is actually already an existing platform in use in American hospitals. For example, you can use it to diagnose MRSA, C. diff, mm -hmm. um, BCR able um, uh, with leukemia. So the cartridge though was uh, developed with a grant uh, by the Gates Foundation and so the, the cartridge costs are fixed. Um, I haven't purchased them in a while, but they're, they're somewhere around $10. Okay. Um, and number two, it says at a mission hospital with a sick uh, HIV patient with a prominent lymph node is suspected extra pulmonary TB, should a biopsy be done or empiric therapy be started for TB? Uh, usually empiric therapy. Uh, I, I would say that sometimes you get this kind of conglomeration maybe of cervical nodes that are um, softer and, and, and perhaps more mobile. And we, we do, excuse me, we do think about um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the HIV infected population as well. But if you're talking about a, you know, a solitary large lymph node or, or, or a, a solitary lymph node that, uh, that occurs in two places, in a, in a sick patient, I would start um, uh, empiric therapy. Right. Um, and then uh, number three, how do you differentiate between meningitis caused by TB, cryptococcus, and malaria in HIV positive patients? So uh, I, 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 I'm a big fan of uh, the history and physical and, uh, and epidemiology. I often say our best test is is epidemiology and our second best test is a uh, test of treatment. Uh, so uh, we don't, you know, we don't want to start patients on, on, on medicines like amphotericin for cryptococcal meningitis or TB treatment just, just carelessly. But uh, if I saw a patient come in with what I'll call CNS syndrome, so maybe they're confused, maybe they got weakness on one or both sides, maybe they got cranial nerve palsies. Uh, I, the first thing that I want to know is how long have they been sick? So if they've been sick only two days, then malaria or bacterial meningitis is way up on my list. If they've been sick for weeks, which is usually what we see, then right then, just epidemiologically, crypto is number one on your list and TB is number two. Right. So then, you know, you have some tests there because then even if you can't do a lumbar puncture, you can do a serum cryptococcal antigen and, and try to detect cryptococcal meningitis. Um, syphilis is, is there, um, but, but not that that common. So, uh, but that that is another test that we often send is a is a serum VDRL. So, if you have if you have a patient with several weeks of a central nervous system syndrome, uh, who's cryptococcal antigen and VDRL negative, then often they end up getting treated empirically for for TB, especially if you find you know anything else in the lung or anything. Mm -hmm. 
Very good. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, and and then uh, obviously there's so much uh, empiric therapy that uh, that and you just have to utilize uh, because of your lack of resources. Um, so I appreciate what you're saying. Um, and then uh, number four, it says, how uh, should World uh, Medical Mission healthcare volunteers best protect themselves from contracting tuberculosis while serving on the mission uh, field? Uh, so you know, the technically correct answer there would be to ha have a medical fit tested N95 mask. Uh, you know, that, that is the medically correct uh, answer. Um, uh, the reality is, uh, you know, those are often not available. And if you have them, nobody else has them. So you have to make that personal decision. I've never used any anything like that. Um, the better way is for the hospital to you know, identify and the clinicians to identify who might have TB and then get them into isolation. And, mm -hmm. and hopefully the isolation room has, has good ventilation. Um, that's going to do the most to protect healthcare workers and, and the other patients. Great. All right. Thank you, John. And then uh, lastly, uh, Skip Roy, who's a physical therapist who volunteers with us. He says, how much uh, should I be looking for POTS disease in my Kenyan HIV um, positive patients? With thoracic back pain, but without a gibbous deformity. Yeah, that's that's a good question. There, there's um, some suggestion in the literature, and and certainly it fits with my experience that that POTS might be less common in people with with HIV. Uh, you know, virtually all the cases of POTS that I have seen have been in people who are HIV negative, and I, you know that might be because of the the fact that if you, if you seed the spine, you really need a strong immune system to turn around and then, and then launch an attack against the TB that's lodged there and, uh, and end up destroying the spine. Uh, that's speculation. I, I, I don't know um, if there's another answer. So I would put, I'd probably put it down lower on my list, but it, it certainly, it's certainly a concern. I, I would try to, if you had patients who are HIV positive with that mid thoracic back pain, I'd try to see, you know, look, if they're really wasted, if they're coughing, yeah, uh, then I'd be a lot more worried that that could be POTS. Mm -hmm. Right. Very good. Good question. Uh, very, uh, very probing questions. Um, I just recently came back from a Noor hospital in Jordan, and mm -hmm. they're doing some remarkable work there. They're seeing a lot of drug-resistant TB. Mm -hmm. John, how much are you all seeing in, um, in uh, your work in Kenya? Well, uh, we, I haven't seen a lot of positive gene experts, but if you remember back from that, that had rifampicin resistance, but if, if you remember back from that infographic that showed the, the overlapping uh, uh, types of epidemic, there was TB alone, there was HIV TB, and then there was MDR TB. Kenya is now launched in the middle of that. And uh, I don't know off the top of my head, you know, if they're probably looking at several percent of, of de novo cases or or MD, you know, to get into that area of the infographic, you probably have to have several percent of your de novo cases or MDR. Um, so, so it is a concern. I, I would point out, uh, because this comes up sometimes when people ask about empirical therapy, and I, I want, you know, if you, if you give empirical therapy, won't you, won't you create MDR? You know, MDR is, is really created by inadequate dosing of the medicines and inadequate ingestion of the medicines. But um, you know, if you happen to overtreat, you're not going to create MDR TB by overtreating. And if the patient has TB, it's their right to be treated. <laughs> you know, not only their right, but everyone around them, you know, needs to be protected as well. So I don't think aggressive empirical treatment itself is is to blame for for MDR. Um, there's there's data that patients with HIV don't absorb the TB medicines as well, and that low serum levels of the drugs uh, really do, do a lot more to promote drug resistance. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, one other, um, just uh, in my observations at um, uh, Anora Hospital, they're doing a lot of, um, of video um, observed therapy. Um, mm. What is, uh, and, you know, which is, uh, I had actually never seen that before, which is obviously an offshoot from uh, directly observed therapy. And um, they really uh, reach out to a lot of uh, patients in the Middle East uh, through that uh, modality. What do you all utilize that there at Mayoa, or uh, what? Are, what are your thoughts on that? 
Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. I, I know something about Anora Hospital and the fact that patients come from all over the Middle East. So I, I see that as a very innovative and clever way to deal with the challenges that they're facing. Uh, you know, ideally, these patients would get community-based, you know, a community health worker going out to, to deliver their, their TB treatment, but that is just, there. we don't have nearly enough resources for anything like that. Uh, I, you know, I was involved with uh, uh, community support programs for people with HIV in both Kenya and Malawi, and so we certainly integrated some, some amount of follow-up, but not daily directly observed therapy that just... Mm-hmm wasn't possible. So we try to put a lot of effort into patient education and family education as, as they leave the hospital. Right. A lot of challenges with so many limited resources. But mm. um, John, that is all the questions that I see um, before me. Um, again, just want to thank you so much. That was a phenomenal presentation. Um, I just want to remind everybody um, that there is CME credit uh, available for this session. Uh, the form and instructions uh, will be in the email that will be forthcoming. And uh, there'll be, again, a link to this recording. Um, And also you can download um, a digital copy of Dr. Fielder's book, Tuberculosis in the Era of HIV, um, in the link um, for today's webinar at health.samaritanspurse.org. And um, if you're not on our email list, you can join the forum again at uh, health.samaritanspurse.org to learn of upcoming events. Our next presentation, uh, scheduled presentation, will be uh, Wednesday, April the 8th. Very excited to to have uh, the host, Dr. uh, Duodane Limfuka, um, who is a PAX graduate and uh, will be speaking about uh, training Christian surgeons as an answer to the surgical needs in Africa. So I'm really excited to have Dr. Uh, Limfuka coming uh, from Elwa Hospital in Liberia for that presentation. And um, with that, I think it's uh, time to wrap it up. Dr. Fielder, thank you so much. Thank you for our, uh, to our listening audience. Y'all have a great day. God bless.